Welcome everyone to the Town of Brookfield Select Board meeting Thursday, July 18th. Uh, please stand to pledge the flag. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we take a couple of things out of order. I'd like to start with number nine. Any discussion? No. Were there anything else or just nine? I think number nine is the only thing I'm interested in. All right. Well, I, well regardless of whether that's what you're interested oh, in, I oh. prefer to just take it as a general vote to take things out of order at the discretion of the Let me make an amendment that that be at the discretion of the chair. Sure. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 So, do you want to go with? Sure. So, I would like to have, or I would like it to be that the public have an opportunity to speak on anything that we're discussing at the time we're discussing. And I don't want it to go on for hours, but I'd like to at least give a two minute opportunity for the public to respond or have a comment on anything that we're talking on on the agenda at the specific time. Oh. So, again, this is one of those things where I, I just want to be mindful of a couple of things. It presumes good actors, okay? I would prefer if we were going to start back up with public comment that we specify the items on the agenda to which we're taking public comment, and I think it's our responsibility to annotate the ones that we feel are most likely to have pertinent comment. But the reason why I say it presumes good actors is it, it's not beyond the pale for someone to choose to comment on every item on the agenda just because they can, if we limit it to two minutes. So uh, I think there are times when it's appropriate to seek public comment, but I also don't want to throw the door wide open either and I would say it does need to be limited to items on the agenda it's not a free-for-all I agree and I I would like to at least start with opening it up if it becomes a problem I will quickly address it and make a motion that we kind of follow your guideline what you just said if it and, and make it specific to more if it has something to do if, if it starts getting carried away I don't want to be here till 11 o'clock so if it starts getting carried away I'll immediately recognize it you recognize it or Brad we'll put a stop to it immediately but. I don't know that we have that flexibility either we've established what the rules are going to be in advance or we don't and and I think that's one of the areas have we consulted at all with KP because there's a lot of legal cases across the state over public comment and and the black and white of open or not seems to be much more manageable than anything else yeah there are a couple caveats with opening up for for public access and public discussion uh, for some of the reasons uh, uh, Beth that you've just mentioned I know there is uh, case law out there where by opening up for public discussion or dialogue that it is deemed a uh, restriction of First Amendment rights if you say you can only speak about these three or four agenda items. Um, I, I think time limitations, quote unquote, within reason, you know, who, who can define that, um, I think are more generally acceptable. One other caveat I would have is uh, also specifically if it is the, I guess, broader aspect of discussing you know, just about anything under the sun type of thing, that you have to be very, very wary as members of the select board, you can't let someone draw you into a discussion or a debate 
about something that is not on the agenda because then that would be an open meeting law violation. So I believe if we do open up for public access, it probably a worthwhile investment to have Coppelman and Page put some guardrails on it for us. I could certainly bring that back to the, to the board, say these are the guardrails suggested by town council, and then you all can deliberate and decide if it's, if it's worth that. I feel strong that if there's an item on the agenda and the public is here to talk about it, I would like to hear what they have to say. If it gets to be a problem, and we're here as, until 10.30 at night as a result of allowing people to speak, then we'll deal with it then, and we could stop public access at any time. But as of right now, I would like to... That's what I'm concerned about, is I don't think you can stop public well, I, access. I don't, mean, I don't mean during the meeting. I mean at the next meeting, we won't have public access if it becomes a problem. But I would like to put a good faith effort forward to allow the public to have access. I personally like the idea of the guardrails. <laughs> yeah, well, we can't decide it tonight anyway, right? right? So, but, well, anything we decide tonight doesn't apply to tonight because. Yeah. And I'd like it to wasn't have some more research. For it to be, it, to give people reasonable notice that yeah. if they wanted to speak on any of these topics, and now we have public access, so then we would be. I would like to tre treating uh, unfairly the public that's not here tonight. Mm -hmm. So, I I'd say this is a good discussion. My recommendation would be we consult first, then decide what to do. You can put it on, Brad, if, maybe if you're okay with putting on the next meeting's agenda, Yeah. we can decide it. And then. I'd like to just, I need to educate myself yeah. better if we're doing that. Do we want to go? Or well, well, I guess we, we have. Okay. I mean, we have a motion and a second. All right. All in favor? Right. No. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so, so I'll, make a, I'll make a motion. That, um, I'd like to make a motion that we refer the topic to Coleman and Page to get some recommendations and guidelines around uh, the current state of public access and um, uh, the current case law that's occurring throughout the state relative to public access. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> uh, we'll start back up at one. Tree contracts discussion. <laughs> Maybe we should have just had you set up here to be We should have just, started you there. <laughs> Good evening. I'm, I guess I'm here to answer some con uh, questions about tr tree contracts. Okay. And then I just just leave it. Okay, you got it. Did you want me to start the discussion? Sure. <laughs> okay. So well, we're currently without a tree contract, and I was hoping we could put one out for uh, invitation to bid. Partially, this is my responsibility. I had a hip surgery, which got me a little behind. But uh, I know there's been some questions about it. Uh, but what I'd like to do is put an invitation out to bid with the current contract we have so we can find uh, a contractor. I, I sent an email to the select board a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had a discussion about doing contracts where we have a, a fixed, fixed contract, a certain number of trees, we get a quote and a price. I went home and I thought more about this and I, I I identified a bunch of problems with this, one specifically being emergency work. If, if a tree were to fall right now and, and block a road, I don't have a contractor available to, to deal with this. And our current contract has a provision for emergencies within a 24-hour response. 
if we do a fixed price contract, now I have to put that out to bid and wait until someone bids on it so that we can then get to it and clean it up. So that was one of my biggest problems. Um, another question I had, which would probably be more for, for council, is if we do multiple fixed price bids and we exceed the $25,000 threshold, um, do we need a performance bond, which is required by law, and do we need a performance bond for each fixed bid prior to? I, I, I don't know the answer to the question, but that was another one of the problems that I came up with with doing fixed quote bids. Besides having to do multiple bids, it also takes time. So if I put out a bid for 10 trees, I have to wait for somebody to bid on it. Then if we accept the bid and then we can go do work, then another 10 trees. So there's weeks in between waiting for someone to bid on it if they do, which was another problem I identified. So I, I guess I'm here asking if we can use the current contract, get that out, because we are a little bit behind. We're into the new fiscal year. And like I said, I don't have a contractor if there's an emergency situation to deal with it at present. So what would be an emergency situation because actually I had a conversation with highway department because we just had some storms this past week and I said we don't have a tree contract if something happens you know what happens and they well in the event say, of a storm say a limber to they fall can at least push it aside and they do have a absolutely yeah. but if it's something they can't handle an, an uprooted tree leaning over the road or or something that they don't have the equipment experience or resources to deal with yeah. then i would need the contractor to come in and and this did happen last year several times yeah i had a broken tree on rice corner road i had some trees on weber road behind tantasco that blew over in a snowstorm and the contractor was able to respond to this relatively quickly which is what i'm concerned with right now well i have to say for 40 years that i know of i've watched the highway department do the tree work with the assistance of a tree company. I did a little research this week. We're the only town around that I'm aware of in our comparative size that's subbing it out the way we are. Okay. The only one. Mm -hmm. Brimfield has 70 miles of roads. They have $30,000 or $20,000 a year to do tree work, and they work with the tree company. West Brookfield has approximately 30,000. The same with more roads, the West Brookfield Highway Department works with the tree company. It's at a lower rate, and because it's a lower rate, we're only getting a guy in a bucket truck. Doing it the way we're doing it does not make sense to me. I've watched the operation on multiple occasions. The guy in the bucket truck cuts a number of limbs down. He has to stop cutting the guy in the ground, one person, drags it to the chipper, cuts it up, drags it. The whole while this is going on, I've watched as much as 25 to 30 minutes, the guy in the bucket truck is sitting waiting because he can't drop anything on the guy that's down below. When the highway department did it, the guy in the bucket truck would cut a series of limbs. It was big stuff. The loader would grab it, move it out of the way, open up the lane. Three highway workers would then chip the brush up it would expedite the process tenfold from one guy doing it on the ground. I know you've made statements that our guys are not trained for tree work. The highway department does trees all the time, limbs in storms. I was down the highway the other day, I took pictures. They have nine or 10 chainsaws down there from 12 inch to probably 40 inch. This has been a custom, I'm sorry. 32 inch, so pretty big chainsaw. So I've watched this happen over the last 40 years. The town of Brookfield has never had a $60,000 budget for tree work, and the last time you were here, we got basically 75 trees for 60,000. Forever, Brookfield has made by with 10 to $15,000 a year in their budget. Now, I know you're gonna say the caterpillar trees are out there and they're really taking hold right now, but no other town has the budget that we do for the amount of roads and what's going on. To watch the money fly out the window the way it has, 60,000 to 75 trees is deplorable to me. Well, it was... I'm, I'm using your words yeah, last no, time. No, no, and I, I checked the current to the end of the fiscal year. We did 89 trees at a cost of $62,400 
which is a cost per tree of about $701, which is a very favorable rate. Not, not compared to how we used to do it. Having the three highway workers assist with the tree company with the town loader and town backhoe. I'd like to hear from our previous highway boss seeing how he did it for 15 years. But it was also not 89 trees. <laughs> oh, it's more than 89 trees. That they were taken down? In a single year? In a single year? How many? Yeah, do you? Yeah. How many? Hundreds. Hundreds? Well, you said 89 trees in a, in a single year time. We're going with that in there and some. The less one. It's, to me, it's an inefficient way. There's no way we can say one man in the bucket and a per an individual in the bucket, an individual on the ground doing tree work is as efficient as the town highway crew with the town highway equipment with a hired professional in a bucket truck. There's just no way. See, I, I, I've mentioned this before. I, I, I disagree, and no offense against the highway department, but um, when you have a trained crew they work together in synchronicity. They know not to get into the drop zone. They, they efficiently chip stuff as it comes down. You introduce guys who are not trained tree guys, who have not followed the ANSI regulations with the training for the equipment that they're required to by law to have, and you introduce them into a tree site, you open up the liability for someone to get hurt. A town employee I, to get hurt. There's liability if I walked off the step and fall and trip, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. But if but the, the contract is doing it, is, it, it's not the town's liability, it's the contractor's liability. The reality of it is we did it in my lifetime. I watched it happen for 40 years, and, and I don't know of a single accident. The highway guys know to stay out of the drop zone. Uh, hopefully. Right? I have, mean, we've have, never had, have you ever had an accident in 15 years you did it? Did, Alan Martell did it for 30 years before you. And he, he was 10 times older than I was, and he got hurt. Alan Martell did it till he was 84 years old. Okay. Does the town follow the ANSI regulation and have training on the chipper and chainsaws and everything no, annual? I, I didn't ask that. I asked, did they go through the training that is required by ANSI Z133? Chipper and chainsaw safety class, correct. So. I guess what I'm saying is Brimfield, very comparative size, with the exception of a lot more miles, almost double the road miles. West Brookfield, a little bigger than Brookfield. North Brookfield, quite a bit bigger. These are all the towns that are doing it. Paying a rate of $1,200 a day instead of $1,800 a day and getting much more out of it by using the, the highway workers. So Not only that, the highway workers, we don't, we don't have a street sweeper. We barely sweep anymore because we don't sand the roads. We just salt. We don't tar and oil the roads anymore. We barely cut road edges anymore because we don't sand. It doesn't have the buildup. The amount of work that the highway workers do now compared to what they used to do is probably half. What are we going to have four guys do all winter in between storms? I, I firmly believe we are wasting a ton of money doing it the way we are. Exactly. That, that's yeah, a good so point. So the, the contractor has to pay the person on the ground prevailing wage, which I believe is 60 something dollars an hour. We can almost get three workers for that. So one of my other concerns is the highway department works four days a week. Scheduling will also now become more of a problem because I'm assuming two to three days at least during the week you guys are tied up doing other things. Okay. Not only that, if it's storm conditions, if the trees are on the wires, the highway department doesn't touch them. But I can't tell you how many times I've seen the highway go out there, take trees down. I don't care what size it is with the chainsaw and equipment we have, with the loader, and as long as it's not on wires, they don't have an issue doing tree work. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah. yeah. I, 
I've never had any problem. So, so I have a question. Would it make sense? We talked about doing multiple bids. We talked about doing multiple contracts. We've talked about doing batches of trees. Would it make sense to just put two batches on the street? One for, say, 50 trees, all in with the tree company. One 50 trees supported by our highway department. Actually gather the metrics on those two batches, what it cost us to do a certain number of trees, inclusive of wages and overhead for our highway department, and get an estimated of an opportunity cost of anything that you don't get to because of the tree work, and then make a decision going forward about what our go forward policy would be based on real math and not just tossing around what we feel about this. Because with all due respect, between insurance, wages, training, and the backlog of work that we accumulated during some of our periods of less than stellar coverage within the highway department, there's both cost and opportunity cost to doing this, okay? I hear what you're saying. You can't imagine what the highway department would be doing if they're not doing tree work, but you know what? I bet you if we brought Pete up here, he may have a laundry list of things that he wants to be doing instead of having them support tree work. Well, I'd like uh, to hear them. Uh, okay, but so let's hear from some other voices. So, the other, I mean, as I'm thinking about it too is, I mean, in this next contract, we don't have to do the full amount. I mean, we can put a bid out for 20000 Dennis, I think, is very valuable as a tree warden given his background, professional background and experience. I mean, I think it would be up to Dennis's discretion when he's a value, I mean, he's got a list of trees. He could say, you know what? Maybe this one is for highway, this one is for whoever the approved vendor is, and try it out like that. An another one of my concerns is as trees become identified by residents or myself, prioritizing trees by risk now becomes a problem if we have a fixed price contract. I've already identified these trees, these are the trees we can take down. Even though this one that I've just discovered is way worse than the other ones, I have to wait on that. Whereas if I have an open contract, I can prioritize based on risk and manage and mitigate the risk Well, I, I think what I'm trying to do is stretch out the budget. So you put a bid out for $20,000. If it's a hazardous tree that you know, and it'd be a coordination of you and Pete. Pete goes, I'm not touching that. Get the tree guy to do it. If they're comfortable and their crew can do it, let them do it. So we can get through this backlog of trees, because the reality of it is, when you hire just the bucket truck, you hire the bucket truck with the experienced tree cutter. The highway guys, then that's $1,200 a day. Three highway workers pulling brush and chipping it so he can drop more trees is going to do double the work than the one guy that's on the ground chipping brush and waiting for more to be cut. But under the, I, but I don't I, know why the, we wouldn't rebid it to just get the bucket truck with the professional tree guy in the bucket and just have a highway department do it, as we did for as long as I can remember, as at just the way that all the surrounding towns that are doing it, with half and quarter the budget that we have. But the scenario I just laid out, well, presume there's no, or very minimal hazardous trees, highway's doing the bulk of it. No matter do you, what, do you follow guy, what I'm saying? No, so, because no matter what, do the a guy contract in the bucket for, truck show, shows up. Yeah. We, do, we never need this single man on the ground that we're paying for bailing wage for it, sixty something dollars an hour. But it would be a, we can supply it would be a, three individuals. When do you that. need to use prevailing wage? The subcontractor does. That's why he charges eighteen hundred dollars a day when he brings a, a, a worker. When he shows up without it, a worker, it's twelve hundred dollars. If it's a twenty thousand dollar contract, do they have to be prevailing wage? At any time they're on the job, they have to pay their help. Prevailing wage working for a community. 
Is that correct, Ron? It's a prevailing wage. Okay. <laughs> so you'd like to write a contract for just a bucket truck and one operator? That's how I would like to see it, like we've done for many years. As long as I known tree work going on in Brookfield. My, my only reservations are the, the liability. And I, I know they've been doing it this way forever, but you have a contract to do everything. It removes the town from any liability if someone gets hurt. You want to know what the biggest liability to a highway worker is? Being hit by a vehicle fixing yep. potholes. I'm, that I'm is sure the is. biggest liability. Right? Tree, tree work is very so dangerous. So do we sub out the potholes next? No. I, I'm just saying tree work has a higher death rate per thousand than police and fire combined, and I think we can all agree that police and fire have a pretty dangerous job. And I just thought it would be make sense to remove the liability from the uh, town. The, the other question I have, if we're going to write the contract that way, is who who handles the wood in the chips? Does the town? The feel? town, and they like they've done it with the loader and dump trucks forever. But I, I want to say, but where do we have room to put this stuff yes. places? Yes, we do. They've been taking it as this as the process has been going on now. Okay. Except for the ugly butt logs, yeah, correct? It's, it's true, yeah, and I, I did put a, a, a so, little thing in the so, contract to avoid conflicts with residents fighting over the wood that uh, the person whose house the tree is in front of has the right of first yeah, refusal. Should, yeah. If they don't want the wood, then others can have it. And if the wood is to be moved by the contractor, it's at the resident's expense, not the town's. And the wood cannot be left within the town's right of way. So I just want to say that as I've watched the tree work go on, it's just upsetting to me. I do manual labor for a living every day of the week. And watching the process happen over the last year with the largest tree budget we've had, to see the few trees that are cut, I, I'm just, I'm not happy over so, it as a taxpayer. So if we have a tree contract, do we exclusively, they're the only one? I can't imagine they're the only ones that can cut. I guess what I'm getting at is I'd like to see Dennis at least when you get your list together of trees that you want to do for the week, try to figure out which should maybe be getting down to highway department and which should be going to a vendor. Well, so the the only wanna... problem with doing all that is we got to take into consideration Dennis is unpaid. <laughs> it's simply scheduling with the right. highway department. I don't department. know. So I don't it's know. One, it's one phone call. I guess what I'm saying is I don't want to. Pete, is it one phone call to you and you'll? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just didn't want to speak for you. No, that's, 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 that's fine. If this is the way we want to go, I just have to rewrite the contract. And I'd like to put something out there soon because we have a storm. We're in, we're in trouble. If we have a storm. The highway department's yeah. going to do it anyway, like they've been doing. Yeah. I, I don't know what you mean by that because well, I, I've been doing this a long time and I've seen trees fall on houses I've seen trees block roads if it falls that, on a house they're gonna hire a private contractor they're not gonna have the town or our tree well that's why I would like to have a contractor available to deal with this that's storm free work. enterprise in my opinion to do with a tree falling on a house I'm not sure where you go well if that. it was a town tree that fell on a house it would be the town's responsibility to remove it from the house and we would need a contractor in place to make that happen I don't know if I agree with that either I agree we should have a contract moving forward, but I just, I want it the most cost effective way for the residents of Brooklyn. Okay. So, so uh, I do want just a couple of other things, okay? I, I think we all agree we need to have a contract in place. And I think it's a sound idea to have one that's pure bucket truck supported by the highway department. I would like a couple things for either our next meeting or the meeting after that. I would like to know how many trees we took down for how much money. And if we took down 89 trees last year, okay, a cost of $62,400, which was an average of $701 per tree. Okay. 
do we have any records from the prior years or we just have the kind I, of the narrative that we did hundreds of trees? I, I have no information prior to when I started doing this. Okay. I'm in the process of getting Ryan Pomprion kept the log of every day he did tree work and how many trees he did. Oh. I'm in the process of getting that from Does Ryan. Have it? No, Ryan. Ryan has. Okay. So I think it's worthwhile depending on the scheduling to put a second contract out for independent tree work and see what it comes back and just do the work twice have both of them open so that if we run into a scenario where we can't support certain trees getting done or we've got both companies available at a particular time given the backlog of trees we can make the decision to leverage both if we need to and it can be for a smaller parcel of trees I don't have any objection to that but that way it gives us an option if the highway department is not available say we do 20 a, a bucket of 20 trees or whatever for the other contract it gives us some options going forward um, including maybe on that one a, a per tree rate for emergencies or what have but you. How, do you how are you going to get a per tree rate I mean well, if we group, we give group him 15, the biggest ones. No, we group 15 <laughs> trees together. I know for a fact, I've run my heavy equipment by the hour, and I've run it by the job. Yep. I make way more by the job than mm -hmm. I do by the hour. So yep. a tree company is going to hustle doing the trees with a group of them, versus they're going to just lally gag along at 1,800 bucks a day until the whole budget's gone, and then the next round comes along. We're going to do it again. I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, I, We've been, all seen the tree companies on the side of the road. True, but I've, I've been dealing with contractors for a good portion of my career, and they almost always meet or exceed my expectations of what I think they can and should accomplish in a day. But so you want to do a second contract for, say, 15 trees? Yeah, where they just do so a lock, stock, and barrel. Like a fixed price contract for yep. 15 trees? Pick 15 ugly ones, pick 15 easy ones, or put them, put them a mix of both. And okay. Well, I'd like to see the real easy ones going to the highway department the if they have been. The highway do an easy tree. Well, yeah, there's that issue. They can't do anything. It's they always at the assistance. Yeah. yeah. It's always at the assistance of someone with a fucking tree. Yeah. What was option number one? Say again? What was contract number one? Recap? It would be a contract for a bucket truck with an operator working with the highway department. And the second one would be a fixed price contract for 15 trees. Perfect. All right, Thank sounds you good. Yeah, sure, no problem. And I will get that to you, Ron, this, this week or next so we can put that out. get it out as soon as possible yes because I, I know we're already a little bit behind the eight yeah, ball a little bit but we'll, we'll get there yep all right thank you thank you okay thank you uh highway department Yeah, I don't. Okay. You, uh, so I didn't ask early for this it. week, I did another tour of the highway department. We've got a 1950s model grader in the highway that there's about two yards of sand under it, absorbing all the oil that's dripping on it. We don't have anyone that can run the grader any longer. I asked Pete what he was doing with it. He didn't have any plans. He said the crew he has now is not capable of operating it on the, dirt, the one and only dirt road we have. We've had North Brookfield grade East Main Street a couple times in the last few years. Uh, I strongly recommend, after speaking with our highway superintendent, that we 
put the grader up for sale on municipal seeing how we're not going to use it. I spoke to the previous highway boss about it. He was in agreement, and I also spoke with Bruce Clark about it. He was the only one left that used to run it, and he said he has no intentions. So, so it's my my opinion that it, it so, go. So I have a recommendation. We put it on the next meeting to vote it as as a surplus because I don't think that the agenda item is sufficient to do that tonight. the agenda item then uh, that's probably all we should talk about based on yeah the, the one question any? the one question I would have relative to uh, the greater is that um, can we just make certain that we have a clear definition of if we were the need a greater or choose to use one in the future what the cost is to lease one rent one you know, if we need Currently, it for a particular we're, we're project. Currently, we're lucky North Brookfield is willing to grade that section of road. It's about a half mile long, um, twice a year for us. Okay. Do we still need to do any work on Draper up where the um, wells used to be and the... That's kind of a touchy subject because that is a private road. Right, um, that accesses public land. Right. For our water supply. Right. We, we still have wells ends, up there, correct? The pavement ends at the water tank. Okay. Uh, there have not, to my knowledge, been any phone calls from that road yet. I have been down it and it does need some attention. Uh, that we could actually scratch up with the backhoe and then okay. back weight it. That's away. what I was wondering, yeah. I mean, yeah. there's there's other equipment that could probably do it because yes. it's a small enough road and a short enough distance. But. It's, a, it's a short distance, so it's not like you're doing a half or three quarters of a mile of road. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, none of us Rich, you've even said yourself that we don't have experience running a greater. You have, you know, a dozen levers in there, and you can make a mess out of a room real quick. So, I've watched it happen, not here, but with uh, folks so I, training in the service. Yeah. Right. Oh. And, and like I said, Noah Brickfield is more than gracious to, you know, grade it for us at no charge. Well, they ought to be considering how much we're saving them for EMS. So. <laughs> One hand washes the other. <laughs> Was there anything else? Uh, based on this, I think we're going to call okay. it quits. Okay. I, I do have a few updates. Um, we reached out, well, we in dis through discussion with East Brookfield, we were all a little confused about a program that started in 2021 called the Fair Share Program. Uh, we just received an additional $102,281, um, which will go into our Chapter 90 account for road repairs. That'll be on top of our Chapter 90 allotment, so that's how, huge. How much was that? 102,281. Uh, the wording on it, on the program itself, was very confusing, where it made it seem like it was already part of your Chapter 90. Lindsay reached out to that program, and they said, oh, here you go. Apparently, if you don't call and ask for it, they don't give it to you. So, so that's specifically for Chapter 90? No, it's. It's just roadway infrastructure. So really, right. any, anything that you can spend chapter nine money on, you can also spend as a fair share of that. Can we put it? Could we use that money in conjunction with other money, say for grant for Gate Road? Yes. Thanks. Um, there's also another program program out there that's recent municipal pavement program through MassDOT. Um, it's MassDOT will do the work to a state number road that is municipally owned. So 148 from Lake Road to Molasses really could use some serious attention. I have reached out to them. I have not heard back as of yet. I'm hoping to hear from them next week, uh, at least to try to get that section of Fiskdale on their radar. Uh, I know surrounding towns have gotten $1.5, $1.6 million in work done for free. So, unfortunately, that doesn't help us with Gay Road. We're still waiting to hear on a grant for that. If we don't get the grant, we could reclaim it and pave it out of Chapter 90 money. Uh, and then I have a short list of other roads that could really use some attention as well. Um, 
we're going to be get, digging in deep to PMs on the trucks. Fluid filming I started today. Um, we're back out to patching now. The roadside mowing is done. The old campground is mowed. We are currently down two small trucks. Uh, one was back in for a warranty repair uh, after a major repair. I'm hoping to have that back Monday. The other truck I'm waiting on a part for. We were able to fix that in house. Kimball Street Design. Um, we tentatively awarded the RFQ to Weston and Sampson Engineering Company uh, to do the design and cost estimate for that uh, project. That is all grant funded. Uh, so I'm sure you'll be getting that paperwork from CMRPC shortly. Isn't that what I just signed today? No, those were Oh, didn't you just say Kimball Street? Yeah. The, so no, I think Pete just said Kimball Street. Did. Did. Oh. It's the same project, so we, uh, we had to get an engineering firm that's what he's talking about. DMRPC is heading in dust. Okay, so are we just. Mm -hmm. You're all over Are we just doing drainage on Kimball Street, or are we doing water also? Uh, drainage, hydrants, and pavement. There's so not the water line in the street? Apparently not. What, what did Piapi do over there the last, last year or two years ago? Do you know? I think there was new gas being put in there. Okay, so this is the lower portion of the yes. Kimball that we're going to do. They're there. all they're also going to address the line of sight issue on the Mill Street end. Pulling out of there is pretty dangerous. What? So if you're taking a like from the left. Even trying to take a right, you have no line of sight looking to the left. Yeah. So they're, they're going to address that issue in the design as well, and also bring up the possibility of making it a one-way street. Did the town take the house that is now gone, the property to the left that's up on the, the big ledge? Does I, the town I, own that, Lindsay? Do you know? I believe the town does own that property, and it is all ledge, so I don't know how much they own. Well, through blasting, they yeah. Think, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That's pretty much where we're at. Uh, you guys were out already today with the hot box, doing a lot of patching and paving. And, um, Speak up just a little. Okay. Yep. No, the crew was out today doing a lot of patching, paving uh, with hot top. So um, hopefully we can get back ahead of that. Um, do you have any? Do you have any plans moving forward? When I watch the interview. When you were hired, I thought there was a 30, a 60, a 90 day plan. Do you have a long term plan or, or even a short term plan going forward the rest of the, the summer? I have not really put anything on paper yet. Uh, you know, obviously, we have a lot of stuff to do, to, you know, a lot of work to do to the equipment. Um, and I needed to get a feel for the new hires and get to know what they know and how they work. And so far, they've both been fantastic. Uh, I'm comfortable where I can send them out to do a project. Uh, the catch basin truck, we are going to get that out next, so that ties up uh, one of the new uh, one of the new hires. Um, from what I understand, it's been about three years since any catch basins were cleaned, so we really need to get caught up on that. I mean, it's my opinion. Would you guys like to join in to get something going forward over the next 90 days? What we're gonna, what well, Pete's we gonna do. Or so I think the original intent, and and I apologize, Pete, because I haven't gotten down there the way I'd planned, oh, okay. um, is that the intent was that within 90 days he would provide us a high-level plan of like what the the I want to call it like the order of merit list on like projects, and it sounds like I mean just listening to him talk, part of it is determining the funding first. Right, so so from a standpoint of we know we need to do something regarding Gay Road, the question right now is, you know, timeline. And, and I think the, the challenge we have right now is it's in his head, but it's not on a calendar. So 
Um, it technically, we had said we wanted it within 90 days of him taking over. I think it's only been 45 days at this point, roughly. Uh, coming up on 90. Okay, is it coming up on 90? I okay. I, 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 can start, I can start putting stuff down on paper and, and yeah. email it to everyone. And, yeah, so, uh, so it's probably sitting on a whiteboard, but not on paper. Well, I've got, you know, a couple lists, but... Yeah, uh, okay. So really I, I think we probably do need to hold the line on like let's get it on paper. So mm -hmm. what's a reasonable reasonable amount of time from what you have sitting on your notebook to getting it in some sort of constructive form? I'll have form. something by the end of next week. Okay. I'll have you know, a comprehensive list of. Yeah, let's let's do that. Even if it's just a punch list, even if you don't have dates attached to it yet, sure. let's let's at least get what you've got. Sure. And then we can talk about getting it laid out on a calendar and and a prioritization put sure. in place. So before we let him go, do you want to take number 10 while he's here? Sure. It's yeah. Call. Well, I don't, go ahead. All right. So the Foster Hill culvert pipe that we talked about. Okay, we met. said that's the one by Brad's house? By Brad's house, okay. yeah. So the last time we were there, we talked about getting all the sediment on the outside of the culvert pipe mm -hmm. below the culvert pipe so that we could make an assessment of the pipe. Okay. I was up there on Sunday and it still wasn't done. Right. I honestly haven't looked at it. It's got to be almost near dried out, I would think, right yeah. now. Yeah. So, <laughs> talking about prioritization. <laughs> so the problem with it is I'll look tomorrow. there's so much sediment, <laughs> you can't even see the bottom of the Pipe. There's so much sediment in the edge of the road that the little bit of water that's there is right at the top of the pipe and the water's flowing through, but it's so restricted. I'm guessing it's close to a two foot culvert pipe. There's probably 20 oh, inches. It's got to be less than two feet. Uh, if you look at the where it drains out, would you, do you have an idea? Because he was up there a lot. If I was guessing, yeah, it's 15 or 18 inches. Yeah. So, can't tell what it is because it's two inches exposed the rest is sediment the water flows through but you can't even see what condition the pipe is in so I would like to get that removed so we can make the decision whether that because that was scheduled to be replaced a couple times and then put on the back burner I just don't want it to collapse and fail and then right so well, if you're going to work it, work it now, because I dry. really think it's pretty dry. Right. When I was up there the other day, it was almost completely dry. So. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Thank Sounds you. Good. Have a good evening. Uh, police department ceiling insulation project. Oh, Lindsay. Um, so I know Brad and Ron know a little bit of where we are with this project. So back in February, Kelly, our former TA, signed a contract with Dario Design, um, who's a small portion of Haley Ward, to do the kind of uh, middle person job of helping us get a good uh, firm to do the ceiling repairs in the police department. It kind of fell off to the back burner, so I picked it up and I've trying to been uh, trying to get it running again. Um, so we've hit kind of a, a point where we may need to um, be adding a little bit more money to this project. Um, I'm trying to determine exactly what that number is. And as of right now, to get what we need to get the IFB live, and it's sort of time, time constraint because we want to get it done before the heat gets turned on. Um, so right now, we definitely need roughly $2,000 to get them to do an additional scope of work, um, bringing the specs forward the requirements of what the materials are for the building so that this doesn't happen again. Um, so that's sort of where we're at. I did speak with uh, Michael, who's our contact there today, um, but he was not able to provide something for me within two hours because I didn't give him much time. Um, but I'm hoping that the three of us or whomever is interested could put, could put a call in and just kind of get all of that black and white and we can just yeah, we I can think get it Ron going. And I yeah, try to yeah I, I requested, I reached out to, to Mike this afternoon requesting a meeting as early as next week Perfect. between myself, Lindsay, the, yeah. the chair, as well as the chief or whatever, is, oh, yeah. whomever his designee may be, Perfect. just so we could have a, a catch up, if you will, or a status of where we stood. 
with the ultimate goal being what are our next steps what are the exact dollar amounts or i guess it's close estimates to those dollar amounts so we have a much better look forward what path forward for the project because as lindsay indicated it sounds like yeah we, we don't have to touch it for another two or three months or we have that much of a runway but that can disappear pretty quickly so yeah. I, w I would like to address it as soon as possible yeah and the project itself according to the gentleman at Dario, shouldn't be a very lengthy project. It's more so just getting the correct wordage on paper so that the IFB can be put out to bid and we can start collecting bids for it. So. And I think timing, or at least even approximate timing, is important for the chief. Obviously, right. he has an operations to, to run, and if he's not going to be able to utilize the station or parts of the station during some of this uh, construction, I think the sooner he, better, the sooner he knows, the better for, for his operations. And the old, only other determining factor is we just need to figure out where this extra money should come out of. I'm not, I asked Lori, but there have been no recommendations from her, so I don't know. It it's, shouldn't be more than 5000 but don't quote me on that. I don't know for sure. How much have we paid so far for this? Uh, we've only paid around f under 500 They've only billed us for a couple of billable hours, but the contract itself with Dario is $18,740 so for their services. this police station is slightly bigger than the average home in town. They have blown cellulose insulation in the attic or in this above the suspended ceiling. They used a woven mat to staple to the rafters or the ceiling joist. And in a couple spots, it's come down. It was poor construction standards to start. But I don't know why we would spend $18,000 to have someone go in there when we have a building committee that took place to to build that police station. A couple of them were really good contractors in town. We could easily get them to get someone to give us a quote to do that properly. I looked at it the other day. I've been in the construction business my entire adult life. If we simply took the suspended ceiling down room by room, Put another type of material up there to keep the blown cellulose in place. Picture most most homes have blown cellulose in their attic. The reason it doesn't fall down is the sheetrock ceiling. In the police station, they took a woven fabric and draped it in between and stapled it to the ceiling joist, and then they filled it with blown cellulose that's hard packed at 15 pounds per square inch. It would be pretty simple of a project to have a general contractor, a couple of them, that live in town to run this, to fix this. Yeah, but we can't go backwards. That's the only problem. Like, we're I agree going, with you, but we're, we're contracted and we have to just, like, well, just this, carry on. This is crazy <laughs> that we're going to spend $18,000 for a company to tell us who to hire to fix it when we can do that ourselves. I this agree. makes no sense. Well, I, I was <laughs> under the understanding and maybe I'm incorrect with this, that 18,000 was supposed to, this was us outsourcing the entire project, bidding, yeah. dealing with contractors, yes. that's doing exactly, everything. That's exactly correct. Managing yes. the project through. Right, right. and that, that is Which I, 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 than, I don't have the time to do it. I rather, mean, right. if you want to take than, it on by right, all means. Right, exactly, rather <laughs> than trying to stand up the, the building committee again, which granted- We don't I, have a building committee. Right, well, that's what I'm saying. But rather she than, said, rather, bring rather, them rather right. than trying to, because I, I hear what you're saying, you know, and and it on one level it makes a lot of sense or if we had a standing building committee, but let's be frank, okay? What happened basically is everybody cheered up and down when we came in under budget on the police station and here we are seven years later fixing the insulation. Okay. I get it, right? It was probably one of the areas where the design wasn't as robust or they or we cut a corner or the contractors cut a corner and here we are fixing it, right? At the end of the day, even with the $18,000 for them to run the project mm -hmm. and fixing the insulation, we're still not going to actually spend what was hypothetically saved when, when they did the building in the first place. So it's it good, sucks good that point. we're here, yeah. but I also want to frame this up from a perspective of that's the decision that we made at the time because we didn't have anybody on the board that had time to go round the committee back up hopefully convince them that a smaller project is worth their time. It's a lot easier to get people to volunteer to manage $1.2 million than it is to get them to manage $90,000, which is functionally start to finish what a couple of different quotes that we had even before we had the engineering contract was gonna to get to. So you can pontificate all you want to, right? But that's what's in place. 
okay? The money was voted out of ARPA. Yep. If there's an additional $1,900 required, I'd yep. like to understand why they're not abiding by the contracted amount since that's the what the project was. That's what I would I like to I think I can about. answer that. So it, okay. it, it seems as though uh, Kelly was going to provide them with the things that were, were missing from that. Like she was going to provide, he, he uh, referred to it as front end specs. I guess that includes like the type of material, the type of you know what a fabric, whatever uh, the specifics of the project itself. She was intending on providing that information. She was intending on providing them with the uh, the plans. Um, those from those the original the, those, from the original build, or I'm not sure exactly. Um, okay, I'm sort of just picking up the pieces, um, but it Understood. sounds to me like those things just weren't provided in time of, okay. before she left. So that's what this additional scope right. is. So, so I, I know for, we're not yeah. spent out on ARPA, so can we just send a note to Lori asking what's remaining that's unallocated in ARPA? Go. I know we've got $66,000 that came out on the state budget. If they ever approve the state budget, that's what's supposed to fund the balance of the project. So I, I know there's some headroom there. Let's just go ahead, figure out what the gap is. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's at least an excuse for why yeah. they're not going to do it under the original contracted right. amount. And, and keep the project plan in place. Yeah, and we should know this. early next week exactly right. what the numbers are, and then it should be smooth sailing. And, and you know, there. next time <laughs> when we're starting, we can have this conversation and not try to have it midstream because mm -hmm. we're not in a place to have it right now. Okay. Good. I just see that I see the dollars flying out the window, and it's just frustrating. But I get it. It's all the way through. Cool. Thank you, Lindsay. You're so welcome. Thank you. Uh, Molasses Hill area's concern. Ron. Uh, yes. Uh, in your packet, you should see a uh, draft response uh, for all the questions that were posed uh, to the board. Uh, last week with the uh, two spokespeople from the Molasses Hill neighborhood. Um, I sp uh, spoke earlier this week with town council, in particular Michelle Rendazzo, going literally line by line, question by question through their, uh, their document. And the document you have in front of you are the responses uh, based upon the conversations with uh, town council. So. I would suggest maybe our best way, and I'll admit it's not going to be very timely, uh, to go through, as you can see, I've, I've done it section by section, and there's multiple questions perhaps in each section. I will read the question, the proposed draft response. The board then can deliberate and discuss whether or not that response is adequate. If not, whatever the modifications are be, we can take note of and then move on to the next question, the next section, the next question, next section. Is that acceptable? I'm comfortable with that approach. Yeah. All right, here, here we go, folks. <laughs> okay, so for section one, the question was um, that there's a discrepancy in the HCA's company name and information. Town Council advised the town and the company uh, to mutually amend the HCA to include and reference the correct company and company information. This is considered a minor, minor technical change that is not material to the agreement. That's what my assumption was going to be. Yeah. I mean, we went through this with Conservation Commission. Correct. A week prior. So I'll make a motion that we accept that response to section one. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, for section two, the question is, there's an apparent discrepancy between the HCA and Brookfield's zoning usage bylaws. The proposed draft response is the HCA does not supersede or nullify any town bylaws. The select board does not have jurisdiction over the planning board and it is the planning board's responsibility to, to determine the appropriateness of the project's proposed usage on the identified land parcel. Motion to accept the response to section two. Second. 
Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. All right. All right, moving on to section three, uh, two questions. Question one, the posted select board meeting agendas exclude pertinent information. The proposed draft uh, response, the select board is well aware of past indiscretions in posting insufficiently descriptive agenda items. We have acknowledged these missteps and have vowed to be more diligent in posting sufficiently descriptive agenda items. Additionally, the select board has reminded all official town board and committee chairs to be extra vigilant when posting agendas. Uh, yep, I can go right to that. Okay, question two from section three. Why is pertinent documentation not available via the standard public portal? The proposed draft response, there is no legal requirement to make all meeting documentation publicly, publicly available prior to a meeting. Currently, the select board has no policy regarding the posting of supportive documentation prior to a meeting. With regards to the availability of pertinent documentation on a post-meeting basis, the select board does post some documents, but it is actively pursuing tools to improve its ability to quickly and efficiently post all pertinent meeting documents to its website. Currently, the town has engaged with a website development vendor to upgrade and improve the town's website. Furthermore, the formation of an official communications committee will be discussed at a future select board meeting. Motion to accept the response to section three. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, section four, I'll say a multi-question section. Considering alleged improper quote unquote inducements by the company, is this a breach of the HCA contracts? The proposed draft response, since the select board was not influenced by the alleged improper inducements, town council believes that talk of a contract breach on these grounds is premature. Question number two from section four, due to alleged non-compliance with town permitting, is this a breach of the H HCA contract? Proposed response, the Brookfield Conservation Commission has recently served an enforcement order upon the company with regards to work performed at the proposed project site. Since the Conservation Commission has not deliberated and voted upon whether or not to uphold the enforcement order, Town Council believes that talk of a contract breach on these grounds is premature. And the third question for section four, will the select board void the HCA if it becomes voidable? Proposed draft response, if there is a clear and demonstrated breach of the HCA, the select board will consider all options at its disposal up to and including voiding the HCA. Any decision in this regards will occur only after consulting with town council and after a transparent and thorough dis discussion amongst the entire select board. Motion to accept the responses to section four. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Moving to section five, uh, I'll say also a multi-question section. Question one, what will the town do if the company does not comply with the HCA? Proposed draft response, if there is a clear and demonstrated non-compliance of the HCA, the select board will consider all options at its disposal up to and including voiding the HCA. Any decision will occur only after consulting with town council and after a transparent and thorough discussion amongst the entire board. Question two, how will the town and the company address unanswered questions mentioned at the public outreach meeting? Proposed draft response, the select board strongly encourages the company to engage in a meaningful dialogue with its neighbors and fellow townspeople. Towards that goal, at a future meeting, the select board will be discussing the creation of an official Molasses Hill Neighborhood Committee that will serve as a conduit for the free flow of project information, questions, and concerns. It is a desire of the select board that this communication structure 
will be the basis of finding some common ground between the neighborhood, the townspeople, and the company. Motion to accept Section 5 response. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Section 6, once again, a multi-question section. Question 1, was the, the Brookfield Board of Health involved in the generation of HCA sections associated with public health measures? Proposed response, the Brookfield Board of Health did not participate in the negotiation of the HCA. However, it will be fully involved in the analysis, deliberation, permitting, and approval process under its authority as dictated by Massachusetts general law. Question two, was the chief law enforcement authority and or fire protection chief for Brookfield involved in the generation of HEA sections associated with public safety? Proposed response, neither the chief law enforcement authority nor the fire protection chief for Brookfield participated in the negotiation of the HCA. However, they will be fully involved in the analysis, deliberation, permitting and approval process under its, their authority as dictated by Massachusetts general law. Motion to accept the section six response. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to section seven. Uh, once again, multi, or excuse me, no, it's a, a, a multi-section response. Section seven question, why is there a discrepancy between the expiration of the HCA and the expiration of the required impact fee payment? Proposed response, the expiration date of the HCA, five years after the quote unquote effective date, allows the town to void the HCA if the company is inactive in its implementation of the project for a long period of time. This expiration date is included to incentivize the company to remain active in their pursuit of the project and not waste time and town resources if they are no longer interested in continuing the project approval process. Next proposed, uh, next section of the proposed response. The expiration of the community impact fees eight years after underlined commencement of operations is consistent with state statutory language and the third part of the proposed response, the apparent discrepancy between the two dates is common with HCAs because they address two different aspects of the HCA. Motion to accept the section seven response. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, section eight. Why was the, quote, compliance to local regulations after February 1, 2024 language added to the HCA? Proposed draft response, this language refers only to the breach of the HCA. It in no way impacts the separate individual decisions of local committees, boards, and officials in their analysis, deliberation, permitting, and or approval processes under their authority as dictated by Massachusetts general law. Motion to accept the section eight response. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, section nine. How will the select board respond and what will they do if the HCA, if timelines are not adhered to? Proposed draft response. If there is a clear and demonstrated non-compliance with regards to timelines in the HCA, the select board will consider all options at its disposal up to and including voiding the HCA. Any decision will occur only after consulting with town council and after a transparent and thorough discussion amongst the entire select board. Motion to accept the section nine response. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and that is uh, the end of that particular section of questions. Uh, however, there was uh, a section in which Mr. Carmen was talking um, at his own talking points. So the question coming out of Mr. Carmen's talking points was, uh, he had described several issues and incidents that concerned him about the company and its officer's conduct. The proposed 
response. The select board has no response to the issues and incidents described by Mr. Carman, except to point out that since there is no quote unquote proper person standard referenced in statutory language related to HCAs, they cannot hold these alleged issues and incidents against the company or its officers when negotiating an HCA. Motion to accept the response to Mr. Carman's talking points. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so at this point, uh, with the uh, approval of the select board, I will finalize this document and send a copy off to Mr. Carmen and Ms. Olison, who were the spokespeople and presenters. Okay. Good. Okay, I'll, I, I, I will do the... Vote on that or? No. Yeah, I... I Yeah, I was going to say, if you, yeah, I think I'd be a person. I'll, I'd be more I'll give you, I'll give you a motion that uh, to authorize Ron to uh, um, do any form of, of formatting and, and other refinement to this, uh, so long as the content remains consistent with what we voted, uh, and to deliver it to Mr. Carmen and Ms. Olsey. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Actually, one thing for discussion, once we respond in writing, um, I would like the opportunity to reach out to the two of them and start to discuss conceptually what we're thinking of with the um, Molasses Hill Neighborhood uh, Committee. I, I feel where they represented the group to us, it, it would be appropriate to start with them and discussing what we'd like to establish for better communication between the neighborhood and the company. Um, and one of the things that I had spoke about with Ron was uh, um, having him sit on that committee as an ex, ex officio member. And I think we did, I don't know if we spoke about this. Um, I know I spoke with him about it. Um, and. Uh, potentially come with a structure for a structure and charter for that committee uh, to the next meeting if I can get it scrapped together. So I'm going to consider this a second motion. So I'm going to second this just to. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 discussion of regarding Maureen Leapak's complaint? Uh, yes, I have actually spoken with uh, Maureen. Uh, I explained to her that since Mr. Kelleher has resigned his positions uh, as town official and conservation uh, and planning board, the town really has no authority in which to even discuss the possibilities of uh, any discipline with regards to her complaint. Uh, sh she understood that. She just wanted the uh, the, the board to acknowledge that she did have a complaint with regards to Mr. Kelleher's uh, actions while he was on those boards, and she does realize that there's really no disciplinary discussion that's even warranted since he's no longer a member of either of those boards. Okay. Is that it? That's it. Okay. So, let me see in the comment from the last one. Well, I don't know if we can go into detail yeah. of it. In general, it had to do with uh, Mr. Kelleher's actions while he was serving on the Conservation Commission and on the Board of Health. Yeah, and we'd have to take a look at it and determine whether it was open meeting, an open meeting topic or whether it needed to be executive session because there's, there's a very fine line between what can be discussed and which type of meeting. Uh, IT manager, discussion to modify compensation, discussion. Uh, 
And, and actually, I hate to ask this, can we even cover it because we put it down as IT manager versus cable coordinator and it's relative to his role as cable coordinator and not as IT manager? I have been wrestling with that uh, <laughs> as we saw that and it is in fact the same person um, who's physically providing that position. So if the public concern was with regards to the individual himself and and his abilities, I, I think we're covered. Granted, okay. it's it's very gray, very muddy, but the fact that they are in fact the same person, I think might give us cover. Uh, whereas okay. I agree if it was two separate people, yes, we probably would have okay. to delay. So I'm willing to take point on this and unless uh, you feel any need to, to come up to the microphone. Okay. Okay, so uh, fundamentally, um, and, and and Jacob laid it out very well here. Um, he's been doing some amazing yeoman's work on getting us back on the right track relative to the cable coordinator role. And the challenge that we have is that as an hourly position, um, it really constrains what he's free to do and how he can schedule his time and he's satisfied if it was to be considered a stipend position. And I think from a standpoint of simplifying the accounting and, and keeping in lines with what was budgeted out of the PEG account, um, it would be consistent with both what he finds acceptable for the role and what we voted for the role to just make it a stipend, $3,300 a month, and then he'll just take care of what he needs to take care of when he needs to take care of it. I make a motion that we approve $3,300 a month as a stipend for Jacob. Second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. And I, I do want to say and compliment him on what a good job he's done for the town and going above and beyond at time. So thank you, Jacob. Uh, appointment, Jacob Gorham, ex officio member of Cable Advisory Committee. I'll make a motion that we uh, appoint Jacob Gorham ex as an ex officio member of the Cable Advisory Committee. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 And make a motion that we uh, approve the one day uh, alcohol pour permit for Oakcomb Farm. Oakcomb uh, Brewery Disc Golf. Yes, well, yes. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, South Pond uh, FY25 license agreement. So we have the agreement in here. This is the new agreement for FY25. Um, there are some concerns. And actually, I kind of wish Highway was here because I had met with them. So, um, with this contract, we are taking onus of overlooking the beach and what happens on the beach property from my understanding. There's an issue with ADA accessibility, which has been brought up at a prior meeting. Um, the conditions of it are very bad. And my concerns at this point are if something occurs and someone trips and falls, given the condition it's in, that's on our liability. So is this that. is this the same contract that we have done annually? We've been doing it every year. Ron, don't we have a limit on a trip and fall? Isn't aren't we limited to like five thousand dollars on a sidewalk or something like that? I'd honestly have to double check our, our policy to to check on that. Um, but I think as Brad had mentioned, with the beach, it might be different, especially if there were known hazards. I think we might have um, more exposure 
for something like that but honestly i would have to to double check to confirm that so why would we sign this contract and take on responsibility of the residents still have the right to use it if we don't sign the contract i i think we need to have some go ahead what do you so, so the whole reason why we let this into place was that technically we don't have any rights to use the beach. The citizens don't have any rights to use the beach without the contract in place. And what would be the difference of the, be the beach versus any other mass wildlife property? Well, right now, because of this contract, we're allowed to put the porta potty there trash containers there, the buoys there. Without this agreement, we can't even do those things. It seems like every time we deal with mass wildlife, it's all They've even that. said that they're not in the business of recreation, yet they won't. <laughs> yet they won't let us swap them the land for something yeah. that they actually would. And they won't trap their beavers that are giving the residents all the trouble. Right. So, I mean, we do have volunteers that have stepped up that can fix some of these issues with the beach. Um, I just have some further questions, like, the, you know, now, now we're talking technical expertise. Are we required to do an RDA? I believe we would, or at minimum an RDA to work within 100 feet of the water. Would we need to do an NOI? Do we so, so I did talk to conservation a okay. few weeks back in one of their meetings, and they were open to the idea of us doing these things down there, but we didn't, we have nothing to go to them with that. We're going to have to go to them. Board of Health was also, I had some input. So what are the actual concerns? Is it the erosion from the sidewalk? Yeah, so there's some heavy erosion currently right now. And then the access from where the boat ramp starts to get down before no, they... No, from the, the parking area above. But that's um, a pretty steep grade, so what, it, what do that, you... Well, that's what I'm saying, too. It's also a steep grade. I don't know what the rules are. So the grade is going to have to match with that. The other concern that I had was having proper railings. You know, I'm going to be able to call it ADA access to the park. Right. It's uh, never going to work. And are we required? I mean, we, we, know, we, know we, we know we've had complaints about ADA access. Are we legally? You're an ADA coordinator. <laughs> so this gets complicated even at the state level, right? Yeah. There's there's a big there's a big push statewide to try to make trails more ADA accessible and enhance um, like the the capability of people with with different levels of capability. Now, enhanced access is different than full ADA, right? You can make it less bad and have it, but but it it's not necessarily eligible for funding. So like we couldn't call it ADA accessibility, but from, and I haven't gone and looked at it personally, mm -hmm. but it sounds like even for an able-bodied person, it would be potentially a trip hazard, right? So we could say, hey, we're trying to enhance the, the, the safety and ex general accessibility for the public by doing these improvements to the existing ramp and path down into the, into the beach, really right? But it's, so it's all eroded. It's all under, eroded right. and undercut, right? right. So, so uh, you and know. Some of that's on the state because there's no curbing here. So when it does rain, it just comes. It just, it just it washes just, right it's off. It's coming right in. Right. So, so fundamentally, my understanding is this does allow us to do some limited level of improvement. And they've given us full on permis permission to improve. To do whatever on the we want to do. The only issue that they had was the type of sand being used to renourish that was their only thing and what they said was the state regulations for that you're gonna have to look look at those state regulations okay, so they said comply with the state regulations and it, do what and you want to do right exactly so i think fundamentally then it just becomes a question of 
what budget gets hit where to do what. Right. Right. So I don't know that we have, do we have funding set aside explicitly for the beach or no? No. Yeah. Yep. Well, you're the beach committee, so. You're the beach okay. committee. <laughs> Come on up to the table. Okay. I don't want to repeat myself. Mostly so you have a mic, Jeff. So hit the green light in order to it's on. for folks it's to on. Yeah. Yep. Okay, not not to repeat myself, but as I mean, you've been involved in the process for the last four years, and, and Rich, it basically the South Pond Beach Committee became separated from the Recreation Committee because it did, the, the Recreation Committee just felt it was too much to try to handle whatever was going on with the, with the beach. And then the state, the, the wildlife people had said, well, you know, we, we'd prefer it just to be a fishing hole rather than a beach. And that's why Concerned Citizens formed this, this committee. And the only tie that I see right now is, is the contract. And I'm very concerned because we've been trying to push for, for various things to improve the beach, but the, the contract is somewhat vague, which is why, you know, the last time that I was here, I'd ask, you know, our only point of leverage is when we sign the contract is to talk with the wildlife people to see uh, what we might be able to do under the terms. I mean, if we have it in writing that we can make, you know, small improvements, but I wouldn't go ahead doing anything without having something from that department saying that we can, we can make improvements because they could well, come it's back. In our they, they did send a yeah, and but if, but if it's the same, the wording is is somewhat vague. It says refurbishment, uh, you know, other or renourishment, something like that. And as far as you know the the accessibility, I'm, I'm not sure the terms are, are precise enough to be able to to act. That that was my concern. I would just like so, some sort so of official acknowledgement. Well, I mean, again, this is my personal, and as also as as the head of the committee to that we have the ability to do so and that we wouldn't be sued if something happens because it's their land. I mean, basically we're operating, we're trying to do something, an improvement on their land. So we really have no. <laughs> right, so fundamentally, as I understand it, and I wasn't present in the room, present in the room what, what Fish and Game's response was, was we are gonna engage in benign neglect and whatever action you choose to take while you're using the property so long as it's in line with state law is acceptable so i think our guidelines are so long as we comply with conservation commission rules and so long as we take due diligence that whatever we do is of a standard that would be a reasonable person would accept i think we're on solid ground relative to what we want or need to do down at the beach so what they've said basically is yes the language is vague we're not going to give you express permission or direction to do anything. Go talk so, to. So you're on your own talk, and roll the, the own, roll, right. roll the dice. Roll the dice. I think it sounds like we're less exposed by doing the work than if we uh, don't do the work. All right. So Good. I think from a from from that perspective, I'd say let's define the what we think the minimum standards of acceptability are and go do it. Okay. I mean that sort of fits with our approach. Um, committees sort of commando approach but again we don't want to spearhead or push anything without having the whole town sort of i'll make a motion behind us i'll so make a speak. motion to support the uh, south beach committee's um plan to uh, develop and execute an improvement plan I'll in partnership it. with the highway i'll second it for well, discussion yeah Okay, let's go to discussion. So, one, I'd like to know where the money's going to come from. Right, and I haven't, I mean, we, we have a, a broad estimate that it's probably twenty five or $30,000 to get that, not talking about the sand or anything else, but just to get the, the place more accessible, not ADA or whatever, because we can't, we can't do that because of, like, because of the slope, but that that, was, that, that's if you had contractors. Yeah. 
Well, again, we, we I think it's an opportunity cost just, because you still you need the materials. Plus, you know, it's the, probably the highway department or volunteers are going to be doing it. So there's still some some cost involved. We do have volunteers, and that's another thing I wanted to bring up discussion yeah. about. What is the can we find out about the rules with using volunteers and heavy equipment to come down? They have to have the same licensing yep. as they have to have the appropriate state licensing as if they were highway department. So they would need a hoisting license if they're doing like if they're using yep. a loader or whatever. Um, if basically any licensing that we would require of a town employee, they have to have. Yep. But provided they have that licensing and that's what our usual standard is, volunteers can operate any of our equipment so long as well, they're Well, no, if they're they're their own, they have, I mean, and they're, if it's own, they're their a landscaping own, company. Okay, if they're a landscaping <laughs> company and they're operating their own equipment, so long as they have proper licensure. Yeah. Because even if I'm operating a bobcat in my backyard, if it can lift right. over six feet, I'm supposed to have a hoisting license, right. right? Now, do people abide by that? No, but we're the town, so we have to abide by that. So, um, so, I mean, fundamentally, if they're volunteers and they have the and they're bringing equipment to the table, so you know, we we probably want to talk to KP about getting them to sign a waiver because if they like roll their own equipment, we don't want to be liable. Right. Um, but other than that, I think we're in a good position. Where, where is the where is the money coming from? Do we have an, a line item account for this? No. So we don't, which is why Brad asked the question about volunteers, because there's there's two ways we can approach it, right? We do a lot of things around this town out of the existing budgets, so uh, that's why it would be good for Jeff to connect with with highway because some of the materials that we have that are residual materials from other projects have the potential to be usable for this project right and and we control that determination um, so but most of that 25 let me just finish most of that 25 that he's talking about would be labor and equipment it's not necessarily materials so we would have to decide based on the materials it would come back to us and we'd have to figure out what's a legal and appropriate place to fund the materials from this where it wasn't necessarily allocated at town meeting. Right, and I wouldn't want to speak for private associations, but I believe that QQLA would certainly be in favor of um, some sort of, yeah, donating material, time, effort, possibly money. Well, and I, I mean, mean because- I knew We did have the donation for the sand for the beach. Right, this, the, right. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, last I knew the gentleman that owned Escape Estates. Yeah. No, I did hear from someone that they thought he didn't have any fill left. Well, I, I think you would really should consider using washed sand, the product that lawn sand and gravel would have, and it's relatively inexpensive because I think you're only going to need a couple loads. And then the sidewalk with the erosion, I think our highway department could easily pave that with minimal funds. And, I don't see why you couldn't get this done for 2500 bucks in materials, and, and I, would, I would spend well, some time down there as well with some heavy equipment. Well, I mean, but I, I don't know Rich, I, I would, I would, I would um, welcome your input going down and looking at it because, I mean, when I, when I walk down, and I'm, you know, I'm somewhat older, but um, I slip and fall going down the, the normal way it's it's like it's like this and then there is there is a place you can go down that way but it's still very it's all rock slide gravel and it keeps wearing out so i think you know the sidewalk whatever fine but i i still think we need uh someone with with more expertise than me just falling down the, you know rolling around that to to, to be able to to give some input I mean, uh, if we could do it if you want to do a site visit i, I would be glad to yeah be, be, because again yeah. We've been talking about it for for a couple of years, uphill struggle here, but I think now that we have some resolution from the Fish and Wildlife and some resolution as far as let's let's do the best we can with whatever limited resources we can to make it more uh, more able for people to get down there then. And we're talking about two different things. One is the sand and then one is the, the, accessi the accessibility. I mean, the sand is not necessary. I mean, it's like a, a We'd like to have it, but I think the accessibility is more important. Uh, yeah, so I think if we go there and get assess it again, I think it would be a. a yeah, I mean step. that's that's a good first step, and then try to figure out because I mean I'm happy to to volunteer time, effort, whatever I can. 
uh, I know Al Jones is on our committee as well as Caitlin Sermont and they're willing to um, and I'm sure I can get the QQLA people to be uh, actively involved also which you know again they, there's three towns that surround the, 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 the pond there and, and um, they've always been very active in Brookfield and, and East Brookfield and Sturbridge have supported with the alum treatment you know we had the $25,000 um, grant or, or don't, uh, whatever you want to call it, matching funds, yeah. matching funds, whatever it was, four or five years ago. Yeah. 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 Right, and I think. Um, just, just in, in closing, my personal thing, you know, I was very happy that Brad took it upon himself. And when I mentioned it to him earlier in the year, he's really pushed it. And we've gone to both the, uh, was it the Board of Health and the Conservation Committee or, or and then the Select Board to, to try to sort of bring everyone up to date and try to try to push it. So again, I don't think it's a short term project, but, um, I think it's something that, that's beneficial to the town, and hopefully we can, you know, move it along, you know, with minimal cost, and, and uh, you know, help the town out in that way. I, I just would be very disappointed if it just re reverted to a to a fishing hole, and the beach beach was lost, and people's access to the beach. I agree. Thank you. So we have a motion on the table. I second. Um, what was the motion again? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So, so we need to figure out when's a good time for a site walk. Yep. Um, quick thing in this agreement as well. Um, I know the chief said he's never really had issues with South Bond, although we just had a lot of issues with South Bond <laughs> over the 4th of July. 4th of July, we always have issues. It's cyclic. Right. Um, and I just wanted to put it out to the board. They keep putting in these contracts I've seen year over year about charging fees which can help limit people access access I don't know so I'd like to find out if we can pursue there's a and I don't know how much the service costs yeah but and Ron I don't know if you have time to look into it or if you need me to try to hunt it down but like uh, Connecticut State Parks have like a you scan a QR code and pay that way mm -hmm. and that way it saves you from having the staff right and then what you can do well, is have volunteers there's, there's, there's different options of what right. you can do as well right so um I, I don't know if we want to the, the challenge is is that we would have to decide what the overall structure would be fundamentally and how we would enforce it so that it, it isn't just a paper tire tile or a paper tiger type of thing so this would be the first that I'm familiar with in the area. Do we really have that much problem there that it would warrant to? So I can tell you the first few years that people brought the beach to our attention, there was a lot of uh, feedback about how much the QQLA has had to do in order to police the trash, police the behavior, police the everything down there. So the the private entity has the reason why the town's not hearing about it is the private entity largely has been the one bearing the brunt of the trash the noise to everything the um the one thing that we found when we started up the south palm beach committee was that um the first first year we had a, uh, a situation over the 4th of July and um, the police had to come down and it was basically people were throwing bottles around and drunk and whatever. But it turned out that 
the signs that were necessary for the police to enforce you know the the rules of the beach had either fallen down or were not there so the first thing that we did the first I think was the first or second year was get all of the signs made put up one of them's in Spanish also and so then at that point the chief in the next couple of years could send the people down and then enforce what was actually posted and then this year we just found out through uh, Marines work that um, we needed a permit that said who was actually running the beach and under what permit so we have little signs now that says um, you know Board of Health and it's tested every week during the season and is when the season is so in that situation um, I think there was just a couple of instances this 4th of July but last year because of the water there wasn't the height of the water there wasn't much and then it was I think three years ago when there was an issue but for the most part things have calmed down once we've got the signage up and the police are coming around this past uh, 4th of July and again the QQLA is very vigilant there were um, three jet ski instances where apparently um, I don't know exactly what happened but they were circling older people in a raft and harassing them and so the environmental police had to come out and they revoked the jet ski people's licenses and from one of the uh, pictures I saw it looked like the jet skis were within the buoy I, I don't know exactly yeah. where where it was but but again it was it was something that was for my feeling on the water rather than people having you know bottles or barbecues or whatever it was something that was more I mean, our, we couldn't really control it. it had to be the environmental, the, the state people, whatever they came out, the environmental police. I mean, there is, but that's really the only weekend that's a problem because we're open June 15th through you know, Labor Day. So that's the one day. And, we, and the chief is aware of it and all the police and we have the proper signage. So it's, it's not a, things happen, but it's, it's not as bad as it used to be, unfortunately. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, if you want to charge a fee, we have the ability to charge a fee. I hate to see it on a small pond like right. that, but it's, that's my yeah. opinion if you guys. I mean, that, that's the only way I think you can handle any of the issues with that. But if it's not enough. Yeah. Yeah. So, so really, we don't need to have. Yeah. No, it's in the contract. QR code. Do like a QR code, like app type thing. Yeah. All right. So, do we want to I make a motion that? Yeah, go ahead. I give. I make a motion that we give you the authority to sign the contract. Isn't it just one person to sign, just the chairman? Yeah. I'll second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Beth, do you want to have more discussion on that, uh, the fees, or are you good with it, or it's... Uh, I'm good with it. I don't feel a driving desire to start charging, but it may be something that if we do start investing in the beach, it may be something we want to look on for follow-on years just to potentially set up a revolving fund in the future for maintenance. So, and that's what I would see the fees going to is, okay. is setting up a revolving fund, collecting them into that. Um, I'll, I'll poke a stick at finding an easy way to collect them that doesn't cost us more than what it, we're that, gonna that we, then we're going to receive and, and see what we have for options. So, uh, 
And then, do you want to come up with a time right now, or to do the site visit? Oh yeah, sure. I'm I'm flexible, so I'll let you guys pick. You're probably what's, the more difficult schedule. What's your weekend availability like, or do you mind? I'm, around, I'm actually here? around this weekend. You're around this weekend? Yeah, if we want to do it like in the morning. Or I can't do Sunday morning until like after 11. How about Saturday? I can do Saturday morning anytime. Okay, I can, I can either do Saturday, well, Saturday morning I've got a 9 o'clock. I've got to meet up with a resident that's asked to speak with me. I um, think it would be done there in 20 minutes. Yeah, so I, can't I don't imagine. see it being that okay, long. Okay, so what time? Eight Saturday morning and then yeah, let's do that. So eight so Saturday eight. morning, okay? Uh, let's 15 minutes to go through the rest. <laughs> Personnel board appointment, Richard Chafee. I'm you wanna arm wrestle over it or no? Do you have interest in it? Yeah. Do you, do you oh, want? okay. Well, I'll tell you one of the things that I'm not in favor of is the and yeah, I'll, I'm wrestling for it, but <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, I'm out. <laughs> I, I understand there's a new annual stipend or uh, longevity that's going around with the personnel board that I'm not in favor of, and I that was one of my motivations. But I also wanted to get a handle on what the employees think they need and what whether their cost, or whether their pay is enough and the one thing that I googled today was the median income in Brookfield and I think that's based on two people in the home and our town employee it's not based it's on two people in the home. Median income values that are shown on the state DLS website is not it's not a um, two people The part that I read, I interpreted it as two people in the home, but working. But, and, and my assessment is that if that's correct, that based on the hours that our employees are working, and a lot of them are at 28, 28 hours a week, that I'm not in favor of any, of a longevity pay in Brookfield because we don't have a longevity problem and I know that's starting again with the employees and I'm I'll make it right out there that I'm not in favor of it so that is one of the reasons that I thought that I would give some time into the personnel so I have a concern with any of us going into any type of committee engagement with a specific agenda like that so i think i think that in and of itself really I, I think sets the wrong tone and can be perceived as bullying or you know just setting ourselves up for a hostile environment i i have my own concerns about the longevity but I, I do want to make certain that we're not, you know, you can ha you have all the opportunity via this board to make those recommendations and I would feel a lot more comfortable um, not having that be your primary motivation for joining a personnel committee. Well, personally. first of all, I never said that was my primary motivation and I take offense that you think that that is my primary motivation because it's not but that's the one of the things that is right at the top of the list right now right so rather than me not make it clear I'm willing to make it clear 
that that's something that I don't agree with. If they, if the personnel bylaw feels that a person is not making enough in Brookfield, I'll be more than willing to evaluate the situation. But I don't know any industry around that the people go to work for 28 hours a week and make a full pay. Not to mention, get the health insurance they get, which is great insurance here in Brookfield, get the sick time, the holiday time, the vacation time. This is a great opportunity to work in this town hall, and I think the pays are really, so, they're so, not lacking in so, my opinion. So, so I'm gonna make a recommendation. I think uh, I would be more comfortable with those discussions around longevity pay, what our total compensation package looks like being at this meeting in this forum and not through your engagement on the personnel committee at this time. That would be my preference. Because we have full, yeah, I see what We have full authority. I mean, I think based on last. I want those discussions to be transparent. I want those discussions to be recorded. I want observer effect in effect as we're having those discussions rather than it being functionally you with a small group in the town hall, not with a camera, not with the same level of scrutiny that we have during this board. Well, I'm taking even more offense to this because yesterday I found out that you and Ron were meeting with David Fromm without the board's approval. And for you to simply imply that I wanna go and bully someone is not accurate, nor would it happen. However, the fact that David Fromm has met with the town administrator behind closed doors, we've had nothing but bad vibes to do with the HCA and how it transpired. And again, you sat behind closed doors today with him for an hour. That's not okay with me as a select board. I want, I want transparency with David Fromm as well as the personnel bylaw. So for you to go out there and say that you think that I'm gonna bully someone, that's wrong. What do we do in this scenario? I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that uh, Mr. Chafee, obviously he's gonna to have to recuse himself from a personnel uh, vote. So that would mean that both select- We don't need anyone on the select board either. Uh, on the personnel board. I mean, uh, it, right. Yeah. On the personnel board. So, do we? Uh, do we have any openings well, we, of personnel? Yes, we have one opening. So evidently there is one vacancy on the personnel board. No, but are we required to have someone from the select board on it? No, no, absolutely not. I would just say where there's an impasse that neither, neither go on to it. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I think, but I'd entertain more discussion with you, Beth, on, on yeah, whether you want to do it or I want to do it. I, I volunteered first. I would like to be on it, and uh, if, if you want to put a time limit on it, and then we switch off, I'd be willing to do that. Want to do a rotation quarterly? Sure. Okay. That works. <laughs> well, how, how about every six months? Is that quarterly seems short, but uh, how often do they meet? I don't even think it's been established yet. That, I don't know that there's any meetings as of yet, but I think quarterly short, but I'll, I'll defer to you if you want quarterlies, I'll agree with that, but I prefer six months. I'm fine with that. Okay. And, and I believe, and we need to review either the tapes or the minutes, that we talked about getting together with people outside of the meeting to start enhancing the communication related to um just to and, and i don't want to go too far off topic by virtue of the fact that i'm going to re reference this back to um the 
Molasses Hill area concerns. I think we did talk about additional communications to verify the information that we received at that meeting. We did. Okay. And there was a formal communication sent to what we were, re were reviewing with Mr. Fromm in the interest of transparency was the document that was sent actually to Karen from his lawyer relative to the topics that were discussed during the, the last meeting and what he felt was a mischaracterization based off of the incompleteness of the sources that were used during that. The only information covered, and you have the notes, and I'd be happy to have you share what notes you took during the meeting, was fundamentally a review of that document that was forwarded by his lawyer. So there wasn't anything other than additional collection of information similar to the meeting that he, that Ron held with KP, was he held with Mr. Fromm. So, you know, if you have a problem with that, my original proposal to Ron was to actually sit down with Mr. Carmen, Mr. Fromm, and Ms. Olsey in a small group. And Mr. Fromm asked that we not do the direct engagement yet with the residents because there was still a lot of emotions around the topics raised at the last meeting. And in the, I think there are times when there's some value in keeping a little bit of a firewall if people know that they're not necessarily going to have a calm demeanor, right? And there's a lot of emotion about feeling Let's just say that, that, uh, that there can be a lot of misinformation on the internet and a lot of incomplete inter information on the internet. There are a lot of emotions wrapped around that information. And, and I have no problem saying that we had that meeting to review what his response was formally from his, I think we received it from his attorney. That, that's correct. The, the author of, in fact, it was actually on his attorney's letter. So, and, and, the, and the intent is to bring that information back in the meeting next week, but we didn't receive the information in a, sh in a short enough period of time to feel comfortable including it in the discussion tonight. So that's going to be part of the formal response from KP and packaged back as part of his response to the information that was provided. So we have it on the agenda for next week. The intent was to bring that information forward next week. Um, so if you want to claim it's a transparency issue, feel free to do that. The intent is to actually move the discussion along in a productive way to start to get all the parties to the table and to get very clear and precise in how we're communicating about the information that's available and not stop at, you know, what's, I, I want to say, you know, have you heard a term, if it bleeds, it leads? Are you familiar with that term? I'm waiting for you to finish so I can say what I would okay. like to say. I would like to be able to address you, but you're going on for so long that I, I, I don't want to answer your questions. I would like to be able to address what you said, but okay. I don't want to answer your questions. Okay. So I, I think I'm done. So. so the reality of it is, if Mr. Fromm can't control himself in coming into an open meeting like this, you said that he needed time to cool. If he can't control himself coming into an open forum like this where no one was going to be able to address him in any way, and I made that very clear with Ron, that I did not agree with a closed door meeting with Mr. Fromm for any reason, at any point, I want 100% transparency that anything moving forward with Mr. Fromm needs to be done in an open public forum. Mr. Fromm wasn't going to be subjected to questions from the audience. I let Ron know that I was not going to ask any questions of Mr. Fromm, that I was going to sit there and listen to what you had to say. I was also going to make a statement 
that I am the very most direct of butter to Mr. Fromm on, on six. Um, Hold on. I am the very most direct of butter to Mr. Fromm on Molasses Hill Road, and I do not have a problem with him doing marijuana. I'm not gonna oppose him in any way, shape, or form. It's his property, and I feel like he has the right to do what he wants with it. The only problem I had with it is his friend doing the meddling in all three boards, trying to help him along with the process. Other than that, I had no issue with it. I intended to bring this up tonight under number 17, items not reasonably anticipated by the chair, Technically, I was just going to say, I think we, yeah, we're kind of going. But, but my point is, technically, but I was made no yesterday at noontime that you were going to meet with David Fromm, and I adamantly opposed, and I know Ron was going to be there, and I think we have a totally different town administrator now than we did before. I have all the respect in the world for Ron, but based on the prior dealings, I want, it's my opinion that every dealing with Mr. Fromm should be done in an open room. He has threatened to sue the town. I have heard more threats from Mr. Fromm that he could sue. If we don't do this, he could sue. If we don't do that, he could sue. And I watched this town hall genuflect for him for a couple of years, all under the guise that he could sue. I watched Kelly, our town administrator, not just give him what the requirement to get a citizen petition or something on the town warrant, but to sit with him and go over it in detail. For hours on end, I would watch his vehicle be in this building, outside, he would be in the building, upstairs with Kelly, he would be in the town clerks with Kelly, for hours on end, with her advising him how to do what he needed to do. What about the, the other but, residents in the community? Aren't we worried that they could sue too? That we opened the door and we paved the way for Mr. Fromm the way we did? When I watch a selectman's meeting and I see you and Brad say, Tom, are you gonna sign this? The, the previous chairman, we're ready to sign. He says, no, I need a little more time. Well, we're ready to sign and we're gonna do it without you. Brad, I literally saw him meet with Fromm and Tim at the Gables. And when I asked Brad about it, he said that, oh, we were gonna do a business deal on the Gables. So for me to want Fromm to come in an open meeting under camera I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be pointed out as I'm reckless or there's something wrong with me or my, like, I only want transparency moving forward. And that's my only goal. So, I'm done. So you just stated, have you have you actually filed your status as an abutter with the town clerk since this is something that's been coming before the board? I have not ruled on anything to do with Mr. Fromm in any way, shape, or form. But I'm simply stating a fact. I'm not filing a disclosure. I'm stating a fact that I that I am an abutter and I don't have a problem with the project. I don't care what Mr. Fromm does with his property. This isn't a public disclosure for me to act on him. It's simply my opinion that that man has the right to do with his property as he sees fit. And I'm not gonna meddle in any way as a selectman to try to stop him. The, my only concern that I had was with Mr. Kelleher getting on all three boards and, and filing a disclosure that said, I'm a, I'm a tenant and I'm a friend when he clearly had business dealings with him. And then Brad said in a meeting, well, he already disclosed that. No, he did not disclose that he had business dealings. He disclosed that he was a friend and a tenant, but he clearly had business dealings in the documents that we had. Prior business dealings. 
I don't know that the word prior was there. It could be, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to hold firm on that. But I, I know there was a lot more going on than what met the eye, and it was pretty obvious to me. And my only point is, going forward, I don't, as a member of this Board of Selectmen, I don't want to see any more closed dealings with Mr. Fromm. I just want it out in the open. And we can have the decorum that no one would be allowed to speak to Mr. Fromm other than the board, and he's to maintain himself in an appropriate way. But I don't have anything personal against Mr. Fromm. I don't care what he does with his marijuana. I could care less. I just want it done the right way. That's my, that's my point. So I'm not making, if I, if I talk to the Ethics Commission and there's a problem with me voting on something to do with Mr. Fromm, I will remove myself immediately. And I will do a public disclosure. Well, I won't need to. I'll just remove myself and recuse. I do, if, if the Ethics Department thinks there's a problem because I am an abutter, I own land, I will recuse myself instantly. I won't even try to act. I'm not engaging. <laughs> I'm not asking you to. Oh. <laughs> Other than point out your, your point of order is correct. That, right. That it's not up for Rich to decide okay. what is well, I'm not, a new not selectman, otherwise so I, I made a you're mistake. You're not new, you're a retread, so you should know all the uh, rules. Right? We're, all, we're also past 9 o'clock. So <laughs> make a motion to continue. Second. All in favor? Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I believe there is a motion on, on the floor with regards to the personnel board and Correct. the quarterly. So I don't believe we've actually voted on it yet. And so I'll make a motion. Actually, I don't know that we have a motion. I don't think there was a motion. Was it okay? It was more of an understanding. Point, uh, Mr. Chafee through um, six months. What's that? That would be January 18th of 2025. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So that'll have to get corrected. So I make a motion to adjourn. Well, we. We've oh. got plenty left on right. the agenda. I thought we, we were going to table the rest. Well, I mean, we they, they'll, they'll take. Extend the yeah, we extended it, it and we can oh. do it in five minutes. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Motion to appoint Sandra Rich to the Council on the Aging. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And then uh, approve the select board minutes for 5-15-24. Make a motion. Oh, was that a motion? I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Second. All in favor? Aye. I can't really hear you, but I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, motion to acknowledge the fire department reports from April, May, and June of 2024. Second. And I do want to revisit one thing relative to the Molasses Hill area concerns. What I had spoke to Ron about was following the meeting with Mr. Fromm was for us to reach out to, and I had previously asked for Mr. Carmen and Ms. Elise's contact information, and I was going to provide to them prior to the meeting on Thursday, a copy of the letter um, from Mr. Fromm as like a pre-read for them for that meeting. Is there any objection to me meeting with them or did you want to wait until the public meeting? Can you say that again in the beginning? Because I missed the very beginning. Yeah. So. so in speaking with Ron, after having spoke with Mr. Fromm, the next step that I had proposed was to talk, was to sit down with uh, Mr. Carmen and or Mrs. Uh, Miss Al Alisi, review the information both that had been provided by KP and that had been provided um, from Mr. Fromm, from his lawyer, and to start the process of 
discussing the intent of the Molasses Hill Neighborhood Committee that would be future meetings with everybody together. So, so that was what that whole process was part of. So are you saying you don't you want to hold off on that until our public meeting on Thursday or can we proceed to start to get the parties to be able to communicate directly and and take the middleman out? I want to make it clear that I don't think you're doing anything inappropriately. I want to make it clear my only position is in light of what's happened with Mr. Fromm and how this whole thing has turned out and how it's blown up. I don't understand why the meeting that you had today at four o'clock couldn't have happened in a public forum. That's my only concern. I didn't want any, and, and I asked Ron to speak to you and Brad about that, that it be done in a public forum, not to make things blow up, to try to make things settle out, and to make this process go along easier. But I don't think it should be done behind closed doors. If, if it's the group on Molasses Hill, with Mr. Fromm and yourself, I'm totally good with that. Okay. So the next step was just the Molasses Hill folks and then getting the two of them together to make sure okay. everybody was working yep. from a particular collaborative mindset, make sure that we had every, all, the, all the expectations, ground rules and assumptions in place. So, so do so. you think do you think in meeting with Mr. Fromm tonight here in an open forum, do you think the outcome would have been any different in meeting him in closed doors? Because he has to he has to meet the public outreach part of the HCA. And if he doesn't, that's grounds for us to remove the HCA. Am I correct? I'd have to you review could, the I, verbiage. You Th might that be able to, there's, but I there's, know. there's there's not I wouldn't want so, to go to court. So, but, but yeah, my point not. is my point is Mr. Fromm knows that he has to pretty much meet the public outreach requirement part of the HCA. He's he was gonna be in an open he, forum here that no one was gonna badger him. I wasn't gonna speak to him. I made that very clear to Ron, I made it clear to Karen. I just wanted transparency. That's all. Sorry if you're taking it personal. I don't mean to question your integrity. I wanted it in a public forum, on camera. That's my position. I, there's no, I'm not trying to question your integrity. This, this okay, go back and review the tape actually after tonight because it's, a, it's an interesting stance did, to take based on, on did the you know spoke. Did you know that I was opposed to you no, meeting with him? I didn't know. I voiced it to Ron and I voiced it to Karen. Okay, so nobody notified me of that. The first this, I heard this, of it, the first I heard of it was right now. And, it, so. and, and I don't think you'd be even allowed to have a conversation back and forth Correct. through a third party. Yeah, like we would be <laughs> violating open meeting law for them when, to have told me that. When? When did the Board of Selectmen decide for you to meet with Mr. Fromm? He didn't. Don't you think that would have been appropriate? Well, I think it was decided with it was decided that we were wrong. This is a democracy. Go, go. Yeah. Th this is a democracy that the select board would make that and appoint you as the liaison. You would be the lead, and, and that never happened. So, I think so how do you think I felt that you're going to meet with Mr. Fromm, I'm out of the loop, when I know that that should have been a vote by the board? Okay. I can see your point. I don't want to linger on it. I want to get it. I can, I I can see your forward. point. I think, we had, I think we had put it, I think we had voted it as, did we vote it as Ron pursuing it? No, um, when approached by yourself with that idea, I had no issue participating yeah, I, I in that what, meeting. I think what happened was I originally approached Ron with the idea to put a smaller group in a room, because I will tell you the one thing that is a problem with open meeting is the dynamic of having 10 people in a room is very different and a very different tone conversation than if you have three or four people in a room. It's just, it's just, human, it's just human nature that if you have a, 
a much larger group of people, the dynamic, and it's not about transparency, it's about folks building one building on another building on another. A lot of times you can start a dialogue with a smaller group, okay? Original intent that I brought to Ron was, was bring both groups into the room at the same time. Mr. Fromm was uncomfortable about that initially, right? And said, hey, let's, let's sit down first with the town administrator. And I took, I took the offer and, and, and was, it, was it done unilaterally? Yes, okay? I think there's been other conversations that we've all had with other parties and other entities. Nothing so contentious. Uh, okay, so scope, right? But you don't check with me on everything that you do, and you really can't check with me on everything right. that you do, correct? Right. But, but so, I need it. So if you want to make a point I, of this. I, I don't want to keep going okay. over it, Beth. Okay. You get my point, I get yours. I, I don't want to, I'm not going to hold a grudge. I want to move forward. I'm okay. here to resolve issues in the town. I just want to make it very clear. How many times have you heard that Mr. Fromm can sue if we don't do X, Y, or Z? I've heard it so many times, I couldn't even begin to recite how many. Yeah. Right? So, what about, my thought is, what about the community? They could sue too, you know what I mean? Like, so, well, I, I mean, just, I mean, I and, just, and you know what, we're already in that position. Someone might sue here. Right. <laughs> I've uh, come uh, to that realization. Uh, I'm no, just someone, sure someone is going to sue. Everything that happens right so, here so, is some, done the way right. it needs to be done. Right, so somebody but, is but at, it, at it, right. With that in mind, that's right. all the more reason, with that in mind, that's, that someone's going to sue, that's all the more reason to have it in an open public forum with the camera. That's my opinion. I also think that that's why it's more important to generate dialogue than to generate airtime. Okay, so the intent was okay to review the document. The only thing really covered during the course of that meeting was the contents of the document delivered. That document's going to get delivered to everybody next week. It's sometimes you have to go slow to go fast. Okay. I so, agree to move on. so let's move on. So, which means for a motion to adjourn. Second. Did, did you? Did you uh, can you wait till it's adjourned? No, I'm doing it now in public form. Okay. I've told you guys several times about the agenda being clear. Ron, you said you were going to make it clear. You were going to go over it. Karen was going to go over it. And Brad, what's not standing? clear? You were going to make sure that it was properly done, correct? You didn't do it again, okay? No, she submitted it before I approved it. It don't matter. If, if it's you guys mess up the procedure, that's your problem, okay? What, what the fact you guys bashing me. Tonight's agenda. Don't take me she serious. She posted before I approved it. You are going to take me serious. You are going to be made notified. Adjourn yet? <laughs> I didn't. Beth, you made the motion, right? I, I made the motion. You seconded. Second. I seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.